angelic glow around them and they're just doing fine. They're Becca Myers. When they're acting, uh, you know, a little bit like uh, the flesh or whatever, then that is the Jordan. So praise the Lord. I didn't want anybody confused. I've heard it's been said that he will say every once in a while, it's not quite that way. <laughs> it's the other way. Yeah, this is a great topic, and I'm, I'm so happy that we have the opportunity, if you will, to, uh, to be able to talk, it. it's been, talk about it because it's something that I've been very, uh, have been excited about, you know, over, over the years. It's a very important do- topic to understand dispensationally. You look at much of Christianity today, and what Christianity wants to know is, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then they want to know, well, when's the kingdom going to come? And so after millennia and generations, people have yet, and the answer is going to be found in Second Peter chapter 3. And that's where we'll start, Second Peter chapter 3. And we look at uh, the dilemma, if you will, that, um, that Peter finds himself in. Second Peter chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. He says, The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another wonderful day of grace. We thank you for friends and all of uh, like precious faith that we can study together with today. And as always, our prayer is that during this time of study, that the truth about your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will, will be lifted up and he'll be honored and glorified. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, Peter's in kind of a tough spot. I mean, because for some 35, maybe 38 years, He's been preaching about the kingdom of heaven is either at hand or he's preaching about the truth of what it's going to be that Christ is going to return. And he's making these, <clears throat> he's making these statements. He's teaching this truth, if you will, based on what he learned from the prophets. Look at verse 2. It says, That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Paul, uh, Peter says, we got this message, we learned them from the prophets, we knew what the prophets were teaching, we knew about our expectation of what to, to expect because of that. And so we said, first be mindful of you. And then he says, I want you to remember what we, the disciples, the apostles of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, what we taught you. And what did, what did they teach? They taught what the Lord Jesus Christ had taught them. And it was a unique coming and it was a promise of His coming, which is unique to their age, has nothing to do with the age in which we live in the dispensation of the grace of God. We have our own special coming. It has nothing to do with what's being talked about here in Second Peter. Ours is the blessed appearing of the glorious God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We look for the, for the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ to catch away the church, the body of Christ which is not a subject of prophecy, and it never was. The prophets did not reveal anything about it. The the disciples and the apostles, they never said one thing about that. But that is our unique hope. And and so we want to be careful that we make sure that we do this. So Peter spoke about this for 38 years, and Christ is still not on his throne. He says, John the Baptist came. We'll look at these verses. He says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Come with me to Rome, uh, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, we're going to read verses 6 through 11. Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 11. Now this is after the death, of course, the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is after that 40-day seminar that he had with his disciples where he talked to them about things which pertained to the kingdom of God. He's talking about those things which are going to be relevant to them 
in uh, the days to come. He says in verse 6, we'll read down through verse 11. He says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? The age-old question that Israel had, that Israel looked forward to, it was not just the kingdom. They served, they believed the kingdom was going to come. You know what they wanted to know was? When's the kingdom going to come? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which ye, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So they, they are to stand there saying, I imagine as they're watching the Lord rise up into the, into the heavens, they had a thousand questions. And then they listened to these two men in white apparel say, you know, he is going to come back. But they, you reckon what their question was? When? When's he coming back? We believe he'll come back. They, they, could, they could fall on Zechariah chapter 14, and they could find that there was a prophetical uh, message about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ that would coincide with this, where when he came down, his feet would stand right on the Mount of Olives, and it would just blow that mountain apart. And the Lord Jesus Christ was then going to establish His kingdom of heaven right here on earth. They knew that. They would understood that. They heard it. But every time you read about the promise and the expectation, they are never told when it may come. They may not still know when, but they have the prophets, as Peter was telling them, to look at and to, they could have expectation for. And when we look at the kingdom, when we think about the kingdom of heaven right here on earth, we know that it's associated with David. It's called David's kingdom. It's the Davidic kingdom. And the reason is because the, the right for the Lord Jesus Christ to sit on that throne comes partially or along with his identification with David. It's David that God gave that throne to. Come to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. And look at verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. That's a good name, isn't it? You know, there's only one person that that, that title applies to. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He, the one that comes and follows after David. Look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And verse 44. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. Because we want to know, we'll learn just a little more about this throne that, that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to ascend to, that is David's throne. Speaking in such, it says in verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall God, the heaven of earth, set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. You know, when the nation of Israel... When Daniel was speaking of these things, when they're talking about that, this is the great promise. This is a kingdom like no other kingdom. During the times in their lives, they certainly saw kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall, kingdoms come back to power, people defeat them, and they're broken up. But when the Lord Jesus Christ establishes His kingdom, it will indeed last forever. There will be no power great enough to break it, no power great enough to make it fall because literally the Lord Jesus Christ in His righteousness and power will crush them, will crush them all. And these verses are about the second, now they're about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. We know this didn't happen at His first coming. 
And now we, we talked about the promise and the, what the, the two men in white apparel promised that he is going to return. He is going to return to the earth to set up this kingdom. And uh, you could say it's a spiritual kingdom. It will be because it's behind back with the spiritual righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is a physical, earthly Davidic kingdom with Christ sitting on his throne in Jerusalem. And what I find I'm interesting and, and uh, sure perhaps a little frustrating for the prophets is, okay, look at all these promises. Look at the hope that we can preach to people. Look at the assurance that we can give them that Christ will return. But they were all lacking that one bit of information which people would have just fallen all over themselves for if they could just told them when. You know, if, the, if, if people knew when, though, you know what they'd be celebrating? The day. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, Christ is coming, but he's coming today. Let's, uh, let's celebrate that day. Let's make it special. But people don't know the truth about that. But again, no time is given. No date is given. It's not that there aren't going to be signs, though. In fact, the prophets tell us about the signs. Come to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. They're going to say, listen, I, we can't necessarily tell you when. He says, we might not be able to necessarily tell you when, but we're going to be able to tell you a way that you'll know without doubt. There won't be any question about when it, it, it takes place and what to look for. Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 14. Moreover, the Lord spake unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth uh, or in the height above. And Ahaz says, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now. O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know, Satan is, uh, he has the ability to mimic. We, we saw that with uh, Moses and Aaron and the, the magicians that came out. They can mimic some things that... Uh, that the Lord and His, and his uh, representatives can do. Here's one they can't do. He can't mimic that uh, a virgin will give birth to a son. He does not have that ability. So when it comes, when they hear, they don't have to question at all. Where's this son coming from? They know it will be coming from, from, uh, from God. Come to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 9. What a great... I bet they, they learned... I bet they made songs about this at some point in time. He says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his a kingdom to order it and to establish it with just, uh, judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I know there's songs about it. We used to sing this at Christmas cantatas. I don't know if y'all did this or not as well. But this is a great thing, and I'm sure brought all kind of joys. Not only a promise of his birth, but what was going to be accomplished uh, by his birth. So it's clear one thing is set, and that Israel has the information to be ready when the child is born. Come with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. We're going to read down through uh, verse 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 35. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. You know, it's the sixth month of John the Baptist 
uh, before as he was uh, going to be born. To a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord thy God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? seeing I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Would you be troubled if you got a message like that? Of course I would. I'm, I'm a man. But uh... <laughs> but that'd be pretty frightening no matter no matter what to have someone come and give you a message like that and to say, yeah, I, yeah, I know you don't know a man. That's why you're going to be perfect for this because you're going to fulfill prophecy. You're going to fulfill that promise that a virgin will bring forth the son who is going to reign in righteousness over the nation of Israel. And he'll be able to fulfill that promise which was come. When the Old Testament prophets foretold of the coming of the kingdom, they also gave signs to... Uh, to look for for the nation of Israel. Talking about the virgin birth, talking about this, but they're also going to talk about, say, see, you're not going to have, it's going to be, it might be a little difficult, if you will, to know which woman in Israel this would pertain to. So he says, we're going to send somebody who is going to uh, announce the coming of the Messiah to identify for you without doubt who this is going to be. Come with me to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. Malachi says, speaking of what's going to take place, he says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye see shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant with whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. We know who that's going to be. He's going to be John the Baptist. He's going to, he's going to be the one that when, uh, when, when uh, his mom was six months pregnant with him, that the angel appeared to Mary. So John the Baptist is going to come. He's going to be bor uh, born. Come to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It says, in, in those, or through, uh, well, we'll see where we quit. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loin, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Here he comes. This is the man, John the Baptist. And you know, it's going to be hard to miss John, isn't it? I mean, you could go out into the wilderness and say, Look over there, there's a group of three or four men. How do we know who John is? John's out there in a leather girdle, and he's just eating his favorite meal, locust and wild honey. That's him. Let's go see what he's got to say to us today. We've come out from Jerusalem, Judea, and roundabout, and let's go find this man. He was clearly identifiable, wasn't he? I doubt there are many that looked exactly like John. So here they, here they come, they, and, uh, and so this is what he says to Israel in verse 1 and 2. He says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, from the Old Testament, you could say from Genesis to Malachi, the kingdom was prophesied of coming one day. We don't know when, 
but it's going to come someday. Then there's this period of 400 years from Malachi to Matthew when nothing was said until John the Baptist comes and what he declares is this. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's no longer prophesied. That had to be, so, that had to be an electrifying message. And I'm sure John was good at preaching this message and delivering it with accuracy. He says the kingdom of heaven is at hand because he says, I am introducing to you the Messiah. I'm introducing you to the one who's going to fulfill this. And then once John came, they understood. And they should have known that the Lord was soon to follow. Not only in birth, but in ministry. John is going to do his part to introduce the Lord Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel. And there are three different witnesses that went out and proclaimed the message. First, we had John the Baptist. And then we had the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Come to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. Matthew chapter 4. And when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. I mean, it's like the times now. John, the one who is introducing the message and letting people know the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's kind of been taken out of the game now. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is going to pick up right where he left off. And as soon as he hears that, he begins what we refer to as the earthly ministry. And verse 17, and from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Man, you know, I'm sure that was as, just as exciting to the believers of Israel as when we talk about the catching away today. The kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. Come down to verse 23 and 24. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. By doing what? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing, which was associated with that, uh, with that program. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were, of, uh, were, were possessed with the devils, and those which are, were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. Nobody left unhealed. Everybody was healed as they came and listened to the Lord Jesus Christ preach. So Jesus went out throughout the regions, and he did. John introduced him, but then Christ went out and validated the message of John that he was the Christ because he fulfilled the prophetical prophecies about the healing and the abilities that the Lord Jesus Christ to accomplish such thing. And he was preaching to Israel, and he was preaching to them about the kingdom. And that makes sense, doesn't it? That's what his message was about. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he has proven to them why. Healing all sickness and all disease. And the people were believing him. I mean, the people believed him. Why else would they bring out everyone from around those regions just so they could stand in the presence of the Lord? The people, the common people, believe the message about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know where the rub's going to be. The rub's going to be with the religious leaders of the day. They are going to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. They are going to continue to reject him, and they are not going to let him uh, prove to them that, they, that he was their Messiah. What they were supposed to do by witnessing this was they were, to, they were to have the evidence that they needed to change their mind and believe that Jesus was the Christ and he was their Messiah and King. Come to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 32 to 34. Matthew chapter 9, verse 32. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. 
And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. You know what the religious leaders did when they heard that? They were offended. What do you mean you've never seen this in Israel? We'll tell you why it's never been seen like this in Israel. And that's verse 34. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of devils. And that's not where we get our power. But this man proclaiming to be Jesus the Christ, he gets his powers from, uh, from the devils. What's Christ going to do? He's not going to be deterred. Look at verse 35 to 38. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples. He says, look, see all these people? The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. It's clear that, that what uh, the Lord's desire was, that he, was, he desired to empower the religious leaders of the nation of Israel to take up with his ministry. And he would give them power to go out and to heal, cleanse, and, and uh, heal sickness and disease, raise the dead. They would have all those powers just as Christ himself did. But they're not coming along with the program. Christ looks and He says, has compassion on the multitudes because they're ready. They need someone to come and to minister to them. And here we begin to see the transfer of the power from the religious leaders to the disciples. Chapter 10 and verse 1. And when He had called unto Him His twelve disciples, He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And that's his 12 disciples come to verses 5 through 7. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Don't miss the biggest, bigger picture here. It's, we know it's not because Christ did not love and appreciate the Gentiles. He knew what the message of the nation of Israel was to be. But we had to have a united front coming from the nation of Israel. We had to have a nation committed uh, behind the, uh, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, the power I would have given the religious leaders, I am going to give it to you. Now you go out and you begin to preach the message that John the Baptist was preaching, the message that I was preaching, that the kingdom of heaven... Is, uh, is at hand. The answer, and we look at this, and we see his offer. And you know, sometimes some people think, uh, you know, they went out, they preached, some believed, and some different did not. And we know that he was crucified after the final rejection of, of Jesus as the Christ. He was crucified. But did the offer of the kingdom, is the kingdom now suspended? Were we to say, that the kingdom will never come. Where is the promise of his coming? It's still there. They still have it. Look at Matthew chapter 28 and the departing uh, instructions that the Lord gave his disciples. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Matthew 28 and verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto him. He's, he's fixing to leave now. He's about to go. Acts 1. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He says, Now I'm going to give you some. I'm going to give you this power. The rest of this power. The power I have. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Well, they're going to go out and to, and to teach all nations. He's going to go out to preach the gospel to them and all the things that, that uh, Christ commanded and, and that Christ taught. That includes the, 
the promise of his coming to set up his kingdom. Things don't change here. They just continue on. They didn't change from Malachi to Matthew. They're not going to change just simply because uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and, a, and about to ascend in, uh, into heaven. And so he comes along and he says, it is, and we recognize it's still the kingdom program, and they are, are to observe all things. Look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 3. When he talks about observing. Now, of course, there should be and recognize that the government that they were under was the law. And so he's going to tell them to be faithful to that. Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works. For they say and, and do not. He says, go. <laughs> he says, they're still in power politically over you, economically. They're still the leaders of the law. He says, I want you to go and keep going under the kingdom program because it's under the kingdom program that Christ will be able to return to the earth to set up his, to set up his kingdom. He says, don't let that falter. Therefore, it's not strange that we find Peter come to Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, it's not strange at all that we find Peter saying this. Acts three eighteen to 21. He says, But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his holy prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. He said, Let's be careful not to blame any of this on the Lord. He did everything that he was supposed to do. There was only one thing left before the for God could send his son and to allow his son to set up the kingdom here on earth. And this is this, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Christ accomplished everything the prophet said that the Messiah would uh, do, and he did. What did the nation not do? The one thing, the one consistent message that began with John the Baptist and carried on through, was to repent, change your mind about this man, change your mind about Jesus as the Christ. For what greater motivation could they have had than the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Do you think they enjoyed being under the political and economic rule of the Romans? No, it was tyranny. Can you imagine living your life under a man like Nero and all those that hated you? And, and only wished ill for you. They should have been flocking, believing that Jesus was the Christ, with the greatest expectation that when he sat on the throne, he would rule in, uh, in righteousness for sure. So if in Acts chapter 3, people say, well, what is it that Peter's really doing? Peter is literally offering the kingdom to them again. The context has changed. As we said, it was promised in Genesis to Malachi. In Matthew, it was at hand. But now in the book of Acts, it is no longer at hand. But he says God will be faithful and he will send Christ back. But not until you as a nation believe. It wasn't just people believing. It was the nation as a whole had to take a stand in recognition of who Jesus the Christ was. We know that they had thousands of, of, in the early part of the book of Acts, thousands of people who were believing that Jesus was the Christ. The problem was the religious leaders still rejected that very fact that Jesus was the Christ. And they began to meddle in the, the ministry of, uh, of, of, the, of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples. They began to persecute them. They began to imprison them. They began to do all sorts of things to hinder their ministry. And they turned the hearts of the people away from the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and just got that they, they couldn't do it. They didn't, and they did not, if you will, change their mind about Christ. And their hatred and their, about the Lord Jesus Christ and what was being preached about him just began to grow and to grow and to grow. And they finally, the final act of rebellion, they stone Stephen to death. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, 51 to 54. Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. Now, Stephen was on quite a roll. He had been teaching them about the history of the nation of Israel and their, their rejection of, of God and his uh, promises and message forever. But he was riled up by the time he gets here to verse 51. And he said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your father did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. You ever been that mad? I mean, I've had seen toddlers that were that mad. <laughs> I've been mad, but I never once thought about running and jumping somebody and biting them, though. <laughs> I'm glad, but these guys, they were, they were, they were just out of their mind. Stephen had riled him up like you couldn't believe. But Stephen, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. We know the influence that Saul, who later became known as the Apostle Paul, we know he had the ability to engage a crowd and get them to do his bidding. We know that all during uh, in, his, in, the, in his time as he was standing against Jesus as the Christ, there were many people that he saw put to death and many that he raised again. And here he is, first time we're introduced to him, but here he is and he's listened to everything that Stephen has had to say. And when it came time, I'm sure Saul said, that's enough, go get him. And they said, yes, sir. They took their clothes off and laid them down at, the, at the Saul's feet and they took off after him. They didn't lay him down saying, okay, but you, would you look after my coat for me? No, they're saying, no, we're, we're going to do your bidding for you. And they did. And they took care of Stephen, if you will. So they go and they start, they drug him out of the city and they stoned him to death. So where does that leave, where would that leave us dispensationally? You know, the message up till then had been repent and God will send his son back to you for the sole purpose of setting up his kingdom right here on the earth. Where's the promise of his coming? Well, that promise of his coming is going to be interrupted. It's not going to be taken away from them forever, but it is going to be interrupted because clearly the Israel was not of a mindset to change their mind about who the Lord Jesus Christ owned. And if in God's, in, uh, in God's sovereignty, God could have just let things take its natural course, which would have included the pouring out of His wrath on the nation of Israel during the tribulation period. I mean, they could go to that. Peter said in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 2, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And they could take the, the scrolls and the scripts. They could turn to Joel chapter 2 and find out, well, this is what Joel said. This is the tribulation. This is God pouring out his wrath upon the nation before their disobedience and for their unbelief. But God didn't. Instead of pouring out his wrath, he interrupted prophecy. 
did not do away with prophecy, did not release and uh, rewrite prophecy. He just says, hang on, and I'm going to insert the dispensation of the grace of God. And this is what he does. And uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ reached down, spoke to Saul of Tarsus at the time, and this is what we learn about that in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And so the apostle Paul received... New information. Paul says, this is the unsearchable riches. He says, you can't go back to the prophets. Prophets had nothing to say about it because they didn't know anything about it. But the Apostle Paul is going to come along and it's through Paul we learn what happened and what is happening to the nation of Israel during this time of the dispensation of grace. Come to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. He says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Don't confuse this with the promise and the hope of His coming for establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth. When Paul says his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel as they might be saved is that they would hear now the message, the only message that can save them is how that Christ died for their sins. He says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You know, that's been true in a fashion all along. They need to believe during his earthly ministry that he was the Christ and he was the end of the law for righteousness. But he didn't believe. They didn't believe. They couldn't take advantage of that. Now come to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 and verse 1. He says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how that he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've done this, they've done that, and whatsoever. But the promise that came back to him was, no, I reserved 7,000 people have not bowed their knees to the image of Baal. But Paul says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? He says, God forbid. And I think Paul would be pretty passionate about this. Because if God had cast away his people to the extent that there was no more hope, not just that they lost the kingdom hope, but there would be absolutely no hope for them. And Paul says, I stand before you today as one who believed in Jesus the Christ. I trusted him as my Savior and I am part of the nation of Israel, and you too can be saved if you'll believe the same. So it comes along. And so now we come along and we see what he's going to say. And the, and the, and the Romans, uh, and they were, no doubt, they were going to be interested in what Paul was saying. I tell you, if you were, going, if you were a member of the nation of Israel, and you understood that things had so drastically changed with your relationship with God, you'd be interested in what, uh, what God was going to do. And Paul is going to give them a great message of hope. Come to verses 11. We'll read verse 11 through 15. 
talking about Israel, he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Here's the message of encouragement to the nation. Now, none of those people could be saved in hope of their one day of their future restoration to a relationship, but they could know that the, the national issues would one day be re established and reconfirmed. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? I tell you, I would suspect there was a lot of national pride being a member of the nation of Israel. And to know that they too, as a nation, not as individuals right now, he says, listen, you need to do it like I did it. You need to emulate the Gentiles. You need to become just by faith and the promise of His coming to establish the kingdom of heaven here on earth is no longer valid for this time. But there will be a day when that message will take part again. So we have Paul, and we have Peter, and we have these messages going. And Peter, it's just like when Peter was telling them. He says, you know, when you crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, it was a bad thing. But it wasn't something that cannot be overcome because God is faithful. And Peter preached to them in Acts chapter 2. And he convinced them that Jesus was the Christ. And many believed on that day. And as we come, though, as we've already said, there was that point in time when they gave up on that. They, they let the religious leaders change their allegiance. And so from Christ's ascension, they... Uh, we see what they had been been doing. We, we see what they had been doing and what they recognized and where they were. And that puts Peter now in this position because when people would say, where is the sign of his coming? You know what Peter couldn't do? He says, well, the signs of his coming, we don't have any new information. All we've got is the old information. Come back to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that ye may be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of His coming? And they'll say, you know, where is this promise coming? Y'all been saying this forever and forever. I'm sure Peter was just getting riled up. He said, I hate to even go outside. You know what I wish somebody would ask me? He said, how about tell us again how on that night fishing that all of a sudden you threw, right when you're just giving up, I cast my net on the side of the boat and I pulled up so many fish it almost sunk the boat. But nobody wants to hear about that. No, no, no. Where's the promise of his coming? Where's the promise of his coming? And he's just beating the air and slapping his side. And he says, somebody get me a sword. He said, I'm going to take care of this. Give me a sword. I won't miss this time. Somebody's head's going to roll over this. So the little known fact, but the disciples, after that little incident in the garden when he cut the soldier's ear off, they said, we can't ever let Peter get his hands on a sword again. <laughs> He's saying, give me that sword. And they're saying, don't do it. Don't do it. But Peter's going to, he's going to have a problem. He's going to have a message to him. And it's going to come from a, a very unsuspecting source. 
He's going to be able to tell them. He's going to be able to give them a reason. He's going to say, I do not know. And the reason why I don't know, because the Lord never told me one thing about what Paul is talking about. But he says, I believe in my heart that the Apostle Paul and the Scripture that he wrote has the answer. Where is the promise of his coming? And he says, well, let's turn and take a look at the Apostle Paul. In verse 8, he says, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. But the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is a message of prophecy from prophecy that he heard. And so he says in this, as he talks about what the Apostle Paul is going to have to say, he he looks in this and look at verse 14. He says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things... Be diligent that ye be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Peter just laid it on the line for him, didn't he? He says, you're going to die a miserable man. You're going to die with questions in your heart about the promises that were made about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth to set up his kingdom. You'll die not knowing why he has not come yet unless you'll turn your attention to what the Apostle Paul has been saying about the change and dispensation, about the long suffering of the Lord and what it means to everyone today. You know, Paul affirmed in Romans 11, you haven't lost your hope. It's still there. But the peace will come from recognizing what goes on in between during the dispensation of the grace of God. Today, there are literally millions of people all over the world. And sometime, you know, their thought is, what can we do? What can we do today that will help God fulfill his promises of sending his son back to the earth to establish the kingdom. They pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I wonder how unsettled they are when year after year it's not happened. And nobody, since Paul told us why it wasn't going to happen, has spoke to that issue. Nobody has given them one reason to hope other than it just did not happen until we read what the Apostle Paul says. What Paul says for us today in the dispensation of grace is a message of comfort, a message of of security, it's a message of peace, enlightenment, and it's a message that honors and glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and we thank you for just the the details that are there and how we can understand it and not be afraid of it. And not wonder, not make excuses about it, but we can just read it and believe it. We praise you for that, and we just pray that we'll be faithful to proclaim the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And it's in his name we pray.